Okay, awesome. So let's get started. What I want to do today is I want to take you guys through Nuke, as you probably guessed from the title of this thing. Uh, but I'm going to assume you know absolutely nothing. So I've got the chat open. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them. And uh, in fact, I need to bring the chat up in the correct location so I can actually see you guys. Just give me a sec here. And hopefully we don't get any feedback now. Okay. So uh, if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to go ahead and download a copy of Nuke. And you can get that from, let me just pull up the website. Uh, it's going to take a while to down uh, to install if you haven't already and download. So I'm just going to let you know. And uh, hopefully during the intro, you can actually get it. So if you go to foundry.com, and then if uh, from there you go to products, Nuke. And then inside of here, go to product info, non-commercial. All right, so foundry.com, products, Nuke, product info, non-commercial. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a little button that says get it now. When you do, it will probably ask you to log in if you're not already logged in. Uh, and then once you've logged in, you can click the Get It Now button again. It will take you to a download link. Okay, so uh, that's how you get access to the actual program, the application. You can uh, use it on Mac or PC. I'm on the PC version today. It's identical. Uh, the other thing is I've included a URL. Due to the uh, YouTube terms, I can't actually post the URL in the chat. But uh, it should be pretty easy to follow here. I've just got a bit.ly URL, 3-A-N-L-G-L-Z, obviously with caps as written. But if you go there, you'll be able to download uh, a zip file containing the media for the files we're going to be working with today. OK, uh, so let's actually dive in and talk about Nuke. So Nuke is a high-end visual effects package. It's really the main one used in the visual effects industry. Uh, Fusion is another great tool. The difference between Fusion and Nuke is that Fusion has a free version and Nuke starts around 5,000 bucks and goes up from there. Uh, There's some other differences as well. Obviously, Nuke uh, gets used in the majority of studios right now, but definitely as you're getting started, uh, Fusion is another great option and it's built into DaVinci Resolve, so you can check that out. Uh, you can download it for free today, and pretty much everything that we cover here will apply to Fusion. And if you go to the movieola.com website, we have additional uh, videos specifically about Fusion as well. So this is focused today on Nuke, uh, but if we go to movieola.com, if I could type, you'll see that uh, if we go to the software quick starts, we actually have uh, specific tutorials on Fusion. There's one actually transitioning from Nuke to Fusion, uh, Fusion Insider Resolve, and then the Fusion Standalone Survival Guide. Uh, we also have a tutorial video on node-based compositing as well. Uh, and a little bit later, I'll talk about all the different uh, bits and pieces that are available completely for free in Moviola. Uh, at Moviola, there's a complete uh, film course from screenwriting all the way through. It's all free, and it's written in a real, really uh, tight format. It's all video-based, but designed not to waste your time. Really focus on six, seven-minute videos to get you up to speed on specific areas like framing, perspective, uh, screenwriting, characterization, sound, visual effects, editing, the whole thing. So we'll we'll uh, have a look at that a little bit later in the morning. But right now, we're focused on learning Nuke. So let's kick in. So uh, Nuke was originally a digital domains industry uh, tool for doing visual effects. They spun it loose in the early 2000s uh, and made it a fully dedicated. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat. It says Link sends you to an Amazon site. Uh, it shouldn't. It should send you to Google Drive. Um, I did check it earlier. Let me know if anyone else has problems. 
okay um, and so it's become the industry standard package for visual effects but it's all node based and it can be thoroughly confusing and there are there are some applications that are easy to learn on your own uh, Nuke is definitely not one of those uh, it's so foreign to the way things are done in nonlinear editors and After Effects that it really pays to have someone walk you through and uh, that's the whole plan here and so you guys have access to the chat so you can uh, ask questions as we go and uh, we're gonna fill you in on all the details so hopefully you guys actually have Nuke in front of you otherwise you'll just have to watch this uh, we'll trim this a little bit and uh, post it to the site for review later but uh, right now let's dive in and take a look at the interface so first up we want to get some footage in and the first mistake most people make is they go to the file menu which is where you would think to go in any other application and look for the import option and it's not here um, so Joe's just asking in the chat why don't I put a link uh, it it won't let me put a link in the chat at least I'm pretty sure it won't maybe if I leave the HTTPS off let me try that so if I pop this let's see if it lets me do this alright hopefully that worked let me know if it didn't uh, just add the actually you probably don't need to add the HTTPS it should add it for you um, okay so uh, we want to bring some footage in we can't do it from the file menu because there is no import footage option instead the way you bring footage in a nuke and uh, let me get rid of this text node now hopefully you guys get in the chat hopefully that link persists um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and delete this node actually let me cut it in case we need it in a second and what we're gonna do is read in the footage so all the keyboard shortcuts in nuke are context sensitive so depending on where your mouse pointer is on the screen will change which keyboard shortcuts do what so whenever I tell you to put your mouse somewhere it's because you need to have your mouse there for the keyboard shortcut to work so right now we're gonna click into the node graph area in the bottom left and I'll explain what all these things are in a moment once we have something to look at and if you press R for read it will bring up a read dialog box okay uh, and then you can click on one of your drives and find a location in this case the zipped file I have for you guys is called nuke for noobs content I'm gonna click on it notice in nuke you don't double click you single click in the file browser to navigate okay if you do a double click it'll take you too many directories down so I'm gonna to go to D my D drive nuke for noobs content right here and this is all the footage we're going to be working with this morning so what I want to do is rather than having to drill down to wherever I put that file every time over on the left hand side here I can click the plus button at the lower left and I can create a favorite folder here that I can access all the time so I'll just keep it called nuke for noobs maybe I'll take the content off the end and if I check all of these boxes here it means that whether I'm reading in an image like we are here or trying to find a Python script or uh, looking for 3D geometry this favorite will appear in all of those browsers because I checked all the boxes uh, in the case of what we're doing this morning even if you just left image browser checked that would be fine um, in bigger facilities there's the option to add a tooltip so if you want to be able to tell everyone hey uh, this particular directory is where we're storing all of our CG pig snouts you could put that on the tooltip and if you're a real geek and you want a little icon to go with it you can add the path to the icon there but most of the time you're just gonna check these boxes leave it with a friendly name that you can easily find click OK and you'll see now I have a shortcut whenever I click on that it's gonna take me straight to this directory uh, with those image files okay uh, Joe can't get the media did you uh, try the link hopefully it worked um, okay so once we're there we can go ahead and by the way if for some reason you can't get the media you can always uh, grab 
any any kind of media from your drive and follow along. It won't it won't be uh, the end of the world. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the ground EXR folder, <clears throat> and what you're going to find in there is I have a single image sequence of EXR files. Now, if you're not familiar with EXR, they are now the industry standard way of working with uh, any kind of image sequences. For a number of reasons, they allow you to work with high precision float data. Uh, they are <coughs> fairly efficient in the way they compress the footage. And they also allow you to have multiple layers of footage, not just red, green, blue, and alpha channels, but you can have all kinds of extra special data uh, called AOVs, arbitrary output values uh, or variables that come from 3D applications, things like depth passes, specular passes, surface normal passes, position maps, all kinds of other weird and wonderful stuff that we're not going to get into today. But it is the industry standard, and I would encourage you guys, uh, if you're ever rendering image sequences, just render to EXRs. Um, and pretty much every application on the planet can support them now so uh, it makes it makes sense to use them so you'll see here that I have hundred and twenty EXR frames now Nuke lists them as a single line item uh, any of you guys who've used After Effects will know that After Effects it's gonna look like this uh, and I really wish After Effects did the same thing Nuke does you'll see this little checkbox in the lower left corner that says sequences and if you deselect that, you're going to see all of those individual frames. Okay? 120 frames. Now, the difference between After Effects and Nuke in this regard is when you have it uh, deselected, so you're seeing every frame, if you click on one frame, you're not going to bring in the whole image sequence. You're actually only going to bring in the single frame. So if you're working with the entire image sequence like we are, you want to leave sequences checked and tell Nuke to treat this as an entire sort of animated sequence of frames. The time where you want to deselect this sequences box is, let's say you created three still backgrounds in Photoshop and you called them background 01, background 02, background 03. Well, Nuke will see that and if you have that sequences box selected, it will think it's a three frame image sequence. Well, actually, it's just three still images that you want to play across all your frames so in that case you would deselect sequences and then select the three backgrounds and it would bring them in as three separate pieces of footage okay in this case we don't want to do that so we're going to enable sequences and make sure that it's treating it as a single image sequence so I'm going to click on this and I could click open it will bring the footage in but instead I'm going to click next and when you click next you'll see the orange highlight here just deselects and that just says hey I have registered the fact that you want me to import that piece of footage but I'm gonna leave you in the file dialog box here so you can select other things and that's the same as in After Effects again you don't need to know After Effects for this tutorial but I'm just mentioning it for those who know After Effects uh, that's the equivalent in After Effects of import multiple it selects it when we click next and says okay I know you want to import that but you want to stay in the browser because there are other things you want to bring in so now I'm going to click the up to parent directory and I'm going to go ahead and click on farmyard shadow I was in ground EXR before farmyard shadow and I'll select that and click next click the up folder icon I'm going to import the sky.move click clip click next uh, then go into Tower, select it, click Next, and then there's one more, UFO, select that. And this time, because that's the last file I want to bring in, I click Open, and all of those clips come in. Except for the Sky Clip, which uh, wonderfully does not actually have, uh, looks like I don't have the QuickTime codec on this machine, and uh, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. Uh, let me quickly, no After Effects should be able to handle it. This is a little diversion tutorial showing you how to fix footage that's broken. Worst case, I can go into Resolve as well. But uh, I'll go into After Effects here. It's going to be slightly the long way around. Actually, I might have a 
version of Nuke that would open this. Let me just check this as well. The one is of QuickTime licensing in Windows. Let's just see. Nope, looks like it can't handle it in this version either. Okay. Ah, this is wonderful. <laughs> Just give me a second here. And I just need to grab the license. All right, almost there. And we're in. All right, so let's just hope that After Effects has no issue with this. We'll import footage. Good. Drop it in to a sequence. And we'll just quickly render it back out. Uh, so let's go to an EXR sequence. That's all good. And Sky EXR. All right, of course, the problem is you guys won't necessarily have access to that footage right now. Uh, so a little bit later I might pause and show you guys uh, just put that up there but for now you can kinda live without it apologize for that little kink in the works I'm gonna delete that MOV and read in my rendered sequence Okay, um, so you guys will just have to endure that uh, MOV not reading for you correctly, unless you're on a Mac, in which case you won't have any problem whatsoever. You can use the MOV. Uh, no idea why that didn't show up earlier when I was running through this. All right, let's take a look at these uh, different elements here. So we have five clips now in this case. And the way to load them into the viewer up here is you select one. I'm going to click on UFO and press the number one key. And what that does is loads the image into the viewer. If you can't see it entirely, mouse over the viewer and press the H key, H for Hafit. Okay? Uh, I don't know why it's H. I guess it's uh, home or fit height. Sorry. Uh, the H key means fit height. I guess that's why, but I just like to remember Hafit. That way you can easily remember that's how I'm going to fit the meter into the screen. So whenever you want to zoom so that you can see the entire image, just click in the view and press H. And remember the keyboard shortcuts are context sensitive. So if your mouse is over the node graph and you press H, it'll actually do one thing. Uh, it'll home the icon size. Actually, it looks like they've gotten rid of that keyboard shortcut. The F key will, though. Uh, the F key will frame everything in your node graph. And in the viewer, the F key will do something similar to the H key. But you'll notice that it doesn't fully take up 
the size of the viewer. That's because the H key doesn't care about how it scales. Uh, it only cares that it takes up the maximum amount of viewer you've made available. And you can actually resize your viewer. If you mouse over the border line between the viewer and the no graph, you'll see this hairline highlight. And you can drag down to resize the borders. And that will make your viewer larger. And because I hit that H key, you'll see that it resizes to fit as much viewer as I have. Now when you press the F key for fit, what that does is it does resize the image but only to the point where it can show uh, the entire image in some kind of whole pixel or fraction increment. So you see here it's gone to an exact scale of 50%, whereas when I press the F key, uh, the H key to fit, it's 65.8%. Um, and so in theory, when you're making edge evaluations, you should be at some uh, better average like 50%, 100%, 200% because if you go to some fraction like 65.8%, the OpenGL viewer is going to scale pixels in a way that's not going to be as accurate as if you set it to 100% or 50%. So that's why you can press the F key. For the vast majority of cases, you're not making fine edge detail decisions and so you can just press the H key to make sure that you're getting the maximum usage out of your viewer. Okay, um, I, it looks like everyone's still good and happy in the chat, so I'll continue. Uh, so what we're going to do now is if I select the UFO clip, I can press 1 to load it in the viewer. If I press the uh, farmyard shadow clip, you'll see I, when you click on the middle of it, it highlights yellow to indicate it's selected. Now I can press 2, and that loads into the viewer. If I select the background clip, press 3, it loads in the viewer. Tower clip 4, it loads in the viewer. Sky clip 5, it loads in the viewer. And again, if you're on Windows right now, uh, that MOV clip won't be working. Uh, that had you guys download it. If you came in late, I see a couple of people just showed up. Uh, a couple of chat items up. There is a bit.ly URL link that should take you to a download of the content. Okay. Um, and uh, the only issue we had was for some reason uh, obviously the MOV is, is in a codec that uh, Nuke didn't license. Strangely enough it, it works just fine on my system player but uh, not in Nuke so it might be because we're using the non-commercial version of Nuke and uh, they couldn't uh, license it for that so anyway uh, if you're working on Mac, that won't be a problem. Okay. Uh, okay, Aaron's asking, can you quickly go back over how you import the meter into Nuke? Absolutely. So unlike uh, other applications where you get a file import in Nuke, you click in the node graph, press R for read, and then you're going to navigate to wherever you unzipped those files. Click on them and select each one, click next, and then go to the next one, click next select them all and when you've selected the final one uh, click open so we've got one two three four five folders and it's a single click when you're in here um, so don't double click to bring to drill down into folders single click uh, find what you're looking for select it click uh, next until you're all done then click open and then all of them should come in okay all right um, so if you remember I selected UFO press 1 to load in the viewer. Once you've loaded these in, these are kind of like radio buttons on your car. You can press 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in this case to jump between the different clips. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, it's actually 1 all the way up through 0. So you have 10 viewer buffers that you can work with. You see this uh, node here, and I secretly wish this didn't exist in Nuke. It really doesn't serve any helpful purpose except just to get in the way when you're learning Nuke. Uh, you come to treat it as almost invisible. The only thing it does tell you is which node you're currently looking at uh, because the dotted yellow line it says okay you're looking at the sky clip uh, but you kinda know that anyway so it's not very useful information and this can cause problems because you can accidentally rewire your comp uh, by dragging stuff uh, into one of these lines so it's kind of annoying but it's it is what it is 
But the key thing here is once you've pressed one of the number keys with a node selected, that node gets loaded into that viewer. And the way this works is kind of like in that car radio where you press and hold the button to change the station. Uh, in Nuke, if I right now have the UFO loaded in a buffer 1, every time I press 1, it will jump back to the UFO. But if I select the sky and press 1, now I've connected the sky to the number 1 key. So when I press 1 now, it jumps to the sky instead of the UFO. So whatever is selected, if something selected and highlighted yellow, when you press one of the number keys, instead of jumping to what was previously selected for that number key, it's going to uh, lock that in as the preset for that number. It's a little confusing, but hopefully that makes sense. So there are 10 of these buffers. Personally, as I work, I only use numbers 1 and 2 most of the time. Sometimes I'll load my original uh, source plate. And the source plate, uh, typically when we say plates, we just mean footage. It's an annoying old school film term that uh, people forget uh, makes no sense to uh, newcomers. But anyway, if someone says a plate, like a clean plate or a source plate, they just mean a piece of footage. And uh, so sometimes I'll load the original untouched piece of footage. In this case, the important one would be the farmyard. That's the main source plate. I'd load that into number zero, so if I ever want to quickly jump back and look at it, I can press the zero. But most of the time, I'm just either pressing one or two uh, to compare things in buffers one and two. And the vast majority of the time, I'm just going to press select something, press one. And that's what I'm going to tell you to do during this uh, as you're working. Okay. Again, if you couldn't get the media, just import some footage. Find some images on your hard drive, bring them in, and hopefully there'll be enough for you to play with. Okay. All right, let's dive in and take a look at actually making a composite. So I've got the UFO clip, and I want to put that over the background. So let's bring those two down. And the way you put one thing over another in Nuke is you use a merge node. So I'm going to select the UFO clip here and press M for merge. Again, your mouse needs to be here in the node graph. But if you have the UFO node selected, you click on it, it highlights yellow, press M for merge, and a merge node gets added directly after the UFO clip. Now I'm going to pull that down. You'll see it has two inputs, an A input and a B input. The A input goes over the top of the B input. So now I'll take the uh, outside of the uh, B input arrow, I'll just grab the, the shaft of it at the end there and pull it up, and all you need to do is just drop it somewhere inside the bottom part of the background node. Right? Um, so just somewhere here in the bottom and just when you release the mouse it will connect. Now I'm not seeing the result in my viewer yet. I need to click on the merge node, press 1, and that will now load this merge node into the viewer. Okay? Um, okay, you got, we got a couple of late comers. That's alright. Uh, if you look just a few lines up in the chat, you'll see a bit.ly post, yes, the recording, uh, we're going to edit and uh, show it up later. And uh, you can download the footage. Uh, if you're on a Windows box, you're going to have problems with one of the clips, sky.mov. I apologize for that. When we post this uh, later uh, as an edited version, I will make sure and uh, provide that as well. Okay, uh, but at least you should be, should be able to download the footage and play along. Uh, again, if you're trying to read footage in, click on the node graph, press R for read, and uh, that's how you import footage. Okay. All right. So we have the UFO clip, and I think actually, by the way, on YouTube that you can actually rewind uh, the broadcast if you kind of want to try and play along at a slightly delayed feed. Okay. Um, let's continue. So we added this merge node, if we press 1, it's in the viewer. So the way this works is if you want to see the version of the UFO before it's merged, you simply select the UFO node, press 1, that node's loaded in the viewer. If you want to look at the background, select it, press 1, it's loaded into the viewer. And if you want to select and see what's going on in the merge, after these two merge together, you select it, press 1, and you're seeing that. So it's a really nice way of working because at any time 
you can see any part of your comp uh, before or after whatever it is that you've been doing. It, so it's truly non-destructive in the sense that you can access versions of your comp before you've combined things and all the rest. Okay, so we've combined two elements so far and let's grab the sky clip here and we also have a tower clip. And let's do this. Let's select the tower clip and let's merge it over the top of the sky. So I'm going to select the tower, press M for merge pull it down. Now be careful not to drop it on top of one of these dotted lines going to the viewer node or you'll accidentally rewire things. So instead I'm going to pull it down a little bit so it's not overlapping one of those connecting lines and release. And as we did before I'm going to grab the B input and connect it to the sky. So now the tower is over the sky. So if I select this merge, press 1, I can now see that the uh, tower, the Eiffel Tower, is composited over the top of the sky. Uh, if your viewer is in a strange state, remember you can press the H key, H for fit, to fit it all into the viewer. And if I scrub through the timeline, just click and dragging, I can see that this is all working and the animation is playing out correctly. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, so I've got two separate comps going on here. I've got the UFO and the ground being merged together and then I've got the tower and the sky being merged together. I actually want to merge these all over the top of each other. So I'm going to select... Oh, I should mention one other thing, just a little bit of housekeeping. To disconnect a node... Uh, you know what? And We haven't even covered navigation yet either. So if you scroll with a scroll wheel, you zoom in and zoom out. My apologies for uh, leaving that important little tidbit to this point. Uh, zoom in and zoom out with the scroll wheel or you click down on the scroll wheel, the middle mouse button, to pan around. And if you do something catastrophic like this to, and lose all your nodes off to the side when you middle mouse drag, you'll see down the bottom of the screen here there's a little overlay and you can click on that to jump back to wherever your nodes happen to be. So if they're all the way off somewhere you can just click in here and that will bring them back. Then you can scroll wheel in and out to zoom in and out. Okay, and again, I'm going to grab the uh, little borderline between the two views here and drag up a little bit just to give me some more screen real estate here. Okay, so I want to combine this with this. I want the uh, the Eiffel Tower and the sky to go behind my ground. So I'm going to select the ground clip and press M again to add another merge node and I'm going to pull that down and connect the B input as to the uh, original merge that's combining the tower and the sky, right? So let me just do that again. Let's select the ground clip, press M for merge, and that adds a new merge node. I'm going to pull that down, connect its B input to the existing merge between tower and sky, okay? And then I'll pull this one down here. And if you look now, I'll select the first merge, press 1. I've got these guys combined. Select the met next merge, press 1. I've now got the ground over the top of those things. And then I select the final merge and press 1. I've now got the UFO over the ground, over the tower, over the sky. All right. Now, I may have thoroughly confused you guys while I was wiring that up. So let me just show you a few things. First of all, as I started doing, if you grab the... Uh, this end of an arrow, you can just pull it away. If you pull away not very far, it'll snap back, but if you pull away a decent distance, it will snap that arrow connection out of whatever it was connected to. Okay? <clears throat> and to reconnect it, obviously, you can just drag it back in. And to disconnect from the uh, other side, the input side, same thing. Just pull a reasonable distance away from the node, and it will release. Okay. Let me... Uh, Here's what I'm going to do, just in case I have confused you. I'm going to delete all my merges. If you're all good, don't worry about this. I'm just going to go back over. And I'm going to do it a little simpler. I'm going to select the tower clip. Press M for merge. That's going to add a merge node. I'll pull that, drag that down. Connect the B input to the sky. Now if I select that merge, press 1. I'm seeing this. Now I'm going to select the ground clip. Press M. Now, 
when you add a merge node by clicking the M button, M, the M key, what it's doing is it's automatically connecting the foreground input to whatever was selected. So you always want to select the thing you want on top first when you're pressing M. Then you can connect the second input, the B input, to whatever you want to composite that thing over. So we want to composite the ground over the top of the Eiffel Tower and the sky. So we're going to do that. If I select this merge now, press 1. Now I've got them combined. And finally, I'm going to select the UFO, press M for merge, bring it down, and connect uh, the B input like so. And now when I look at the final merge here and press 1, I've got them all combined together. Okay, see we had a few more people show up uh, in the stream. Uh, feel free to look. There's a bit.ly link where you can download the footage and then click on the node graph, press R for read, start playing with it. Or you can just rewind this uh, stream and kind of watch from the beginning. Okay, let's continue. So hopefully Everyone's good. Let me know if you have any questions so far or if something went catastrophically wrong for you. But uh, at this point, you should now have all of the elements combined. And it's worth just taking a moment just to explain what's going on here. Uh, what we have is the easiest way to understand the nodes is to, uh, to think of them as streams of water flowing down a hill. So we've got the sky stream, and it's a stream of sky-colored water, if you will, flowing downhill and it comes into this merge. Well, we also have the tower stream, which is Eiffel Tower colored water, and it flows downstream. So these two streams meet in this merge, and the result is a combined stream of the two images. Now, you could think of this as what's coming out of the output could have just been a, a single image that we had brought in from disk that has an Eiffel Tower and sky in it. Right? So what's coming out the bottom here, as far as the rest of Nuke is concerned, is a single image, just like sky is a single image, just like tower is a single image. So the output of this is a single image that looks like this. That single image continues to flow downhill until it hits this merge where we have a ground clip that comes in, and those two combine in this merge, and now we have a new single image coming out of the bottom that is a combination of all the streams that went before. Okay? So here we have the farmyard stream over the combined tower sky stream. That new single stream flows downhill into another merge where it combines with the UFO and I'm just selecting these other nodes and pressing 1 to load them in the viewer temporarily. And so when the UFO stream flows in, it merges with the uh, combined stream from before and we get the final composite result. Okay, so it's really very simple. Um, there's nothing difficult whatsoever about nodes, and uh, it's just that it's a completely different paradigm. So if you're used to stacking things in timelines, this can be a little confusing. Uh, one thing a lot of people think at this point is, wow, uh, I could have dragged those four things into After Effects or a Resolve or Premiere or wherever, and I would have been done by now. Um, and that's true, although this probably would have taken me about five seconds to hook up anyway if I wasn't walking you guys through it. But there's a lot of power that comes with nodes w that we're about to see that you just don't get uh, in a timeline layer stack based approach like After Effects or a nonlinear editor. Uh, and so here's why. First up, it's very easy to Pro troubleshoot. If we go, you know what? Um, let me just give you an example here. Uh, I'll throw on a blur. Don't follow me here just yet. But here, I threw on uh, a blur. And now, uh, if I'm going, oh no, my tower's blurred out. Where is that happening? I can quickly just select nodes, chase it up the tree, and go, it's still blurred here, still blurred here, still blurred here not blurred here. Oh, so the blurring must happen in this blur node. Now, it's an obvious example. Um, you know, yes, of course, we know that because it's blur, but oftentimes you'll get something that's clipped or uh, blurring or the green screen didn't pull quite right and you're not exactly sure which node is causing the problem. Uh, in Nuke, you can just chase it up the tree. In something like After Effects, you have to 
solo and un unsolo a whole bunch of layers, look in nested comps, and it, it becomes a lot more complicated. Uh, question in the chat, doesn't Resolve also use nodes? Absolutely it does. Um, when I'm saying Resolve, I'm referring to the traditional part of the editing in Resolve, which is just the edit page where you stack layers of footage up. But yes, uh, Resolve has Fusion, which is pretty much the uh, identical thing to Nuke, just built into Resolve. And it also has a uh, node system in its uh, color page, which is slightly different. But when you're editing in the timeline, you're still stacking things. Um, of course, if you're doing any kind of visual effects work, you'd want to jump to the Fusion page. OK. Uh, any other questions? Just let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to keep on. So all we've done so far is merge layers. We haven't added any kind of effects or filters. So the first thing we want to do on this shot is we want to add shadows. If I scrub through the timeline, you'll see this is a live action plate. This is a CG UFO that I just rendered out of uh, Modo, I think it was, a few years ago. And so it's not obviously interacting with the scene. It's not casting any shadows, and it's not doing anything to affect the real world. And for any kind of CG to look convincing, it has to uh, nicely interact with the environment. It needs to affect the environment and be affected by the environment. Now, the 3D render has already affected the UFO. We lit, uh, when I rendered this in UFO, I uh, rendered this UFO in Modo, I lit it with what's called an HDR, which is an environment that, that captures the lighting of the scene and applies that to the UFO. So the UFO is interacting with the scene, but the scene isn't interacting with the UFO. So what we want to do is apply a shadow to the uh, farmyard so that as the UFO passes over it, it shadows and blocks light from reaching it. And so we're going to apply a shadow to the background. Now in other applications, for example, let's just say uh, Photoshop, you might apply a background uh, sorry, a shadow to the object. So you'd apply a drop shadow to text or whatever. Uh, that's actually, in the real world, not the way it works, is it, right? In the real world, shadows affect the things they're falling on. And so in visual effects, we apply shadows to whatever surface is uh, receiving the shadow. And so that is going to be the ground. So I'm going to select the ground clip and press G for grade. G a grade. And with the ground clip selected, you'll see the grade node gets added directly after the ground clip because that was the node that we had selected uh, when we pressed it. Notice that the grade node automatically wires itself in on its way down to this merge node here. Okay, So we now have a grade node. And the grade node is probably the most common uh, color corrector you're going to use in Nuke. It's also incredibly ugly. You know, it doesn't have pretty dials and sliders. It looks more like something that um, a physicist would use in some kind of Wolfram Alpha MATLAB sort of application. But uh, it, it actually is quite functional. Um, the most important one to know right now is the multiply slider. And that's basically the gain. Uh, I should take that back because there is a gain here as well. But uh, this is basically a brightness knob. Let's just call it that for now. Mathematically, it's gain, but um, the multiply, we're just going to call it brightness. And if we bring it down, we are shadowing uh, the entire landscape. Right? If I bring it down to zero, I'm basically darkening the entire landscape down to zero. Now, that's working. That is creating a shadow, but it's more of uh, an Independence Day mothership shadow that eclipses the entire land, not just a shadow for our little dinky UFO here. So what we need to do is limit the, the area where this background is being color corrected to only the location where the UFO is obstructing sunlight from reaching the landscape. And fortunately, I created this mat that I also rented out of Modo called Farmyard Shadow. If you go ahead and select that and press 1 to load in the viewer, you can see that wherever the UFO is hovering, it puts some white over the landscape. 
Okay. And if you're curious, uh, I just did this inside of Modo. I uh, it used what's called a shadow pass, which automatically creates this. I built some very simple geometry of the barn and the fence line, uh, and just a plane for the ground um, out of uh, from the 3D capture of the scene. Uh, all of this is covered on MovieOla.com. I'll point you to some other tutorials later if you want to get into it. Uh, but this just allows the lighting to interact with the basic geometry in the scene that we care about. All right. So what we can do with this is if I zoom in here a little bit, you'll see that this grade node has a triangle on the right side of it. And this is the mask input. Okay. In Nuke, you always have to pull out the mask input. You can't drag something into the mask input. You can only pull out and connect something to the mask input. Mask inputs are always on the right hand side of nodes. Okay, so in this case, what we want to do is I'm going to bring my, uh, in fact, let me just rearrange things so it's a little cleaner here. If you drag select through nodes, you have to drag select through the entire node for it to be highlighted like this. In Fusion, you only select part of the node and it automatically selects the entire node. Here in Nuke, you have to drag select through everything that you want highlighted. And I'm going to move this up a little bit, like so. OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that mask input for the grade. And you've got to be careful to grab just on the triangle point. If you grab the node, obviously, it's going to move the node instead. I'm going to pull out that mask triangle and connect it into the bottom of Farmyard Shadow. And what that does is it says, only color correct the image wherever it's white. So we're going to get a lot of darkening color correction where it's really bright. And as the as it tapers off to gray, we're going to get less and less color correction. So now let's take a look at our final comp. I'm going to select the merge at the bottom of the hill here. Press 1 to load it in the viewer. And you should be able to see that it's now shadowing the barn. Now I'm at frame 28, so it depends on where you're at. If I select the grade node and drag the multiply slider around, you can see I, I could actually brighten things up and make it highlight the scene in that area, which would make sense, for example, if it's trying to beam up a cow or something, we could have it highlight the ground just around that area. Um, and uh, if I bring it all the way down, I'm creating that shadow effect. OK, uh, question in the chat. Uh, please repeat, please. How did you make the basic geometry? Great, great question. Uh, it's a little bit beyond the intro now, but we can talk about it. Uh, what I did here is um, I actually used a tool in Nuke called the Modeler node. Uh, actually, this too. One's called the Model Builder, and Model Builder allows you to feed in a solved camera once you've done a 3D track of the scene. Uh, and then you feed the camera in, and you can start building some basic shapes. And once I built the basic shape of those points, I then went into Modo and just built some very simple geometry around it, uh, and likewise with the fence line. Okay, So again, a little bit beyond that, uh, towards the end of this class today, I'm going to point you to some other tutorials on Moviola that go into the camera tracking and the rest of it in more detail, so you guys can uh, get up to speed on that. Uh, but that's basically how that was built. All right, so um, let's do one last recap of how this is all working. So for those of you who showed up late, again, scroll wheel to zoom in and zoom out, middle mouse to pan. Uh, there's a bit.ly link in the chat where you can download a copy of uh, this media. Click in the, view, in the no graph, press R for read if you want to bring the media in. OK? Uh, or you can rewind and watch from the beginning. Um, the other thing I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to mouse over my node graph and press the space bar, and that takes me to full screen. Okay, So uh, I'm only doing that because it's going to be a lot easier for you guys to uh, see this right now. But basically, here's what's happening. We already talked about this. We have the sky stream flowing downhill, the tower stream. Those two streams flow into this merge. They combine to create one new single stream. That stream of the combined tower and sky flow downhill where they hit this merge. It combines with this stream coming from the ground, and a new single stream comes out. And then finally, it merges with 
the UFO clip, and then that gets merged over the top of everything that's been before. And that's how this works. Um, uh, incidentally, just this is just my personal workflow. It, it's not required. People work differently. But I, what I like to do is build a spine down the right-hand side where I, ha I start with the main background, the furthest back thing. In this case, it's the sky. And I just merge in new things as we kind of go down this spine of merges. And then at the very bottom of the hill is the final composite that you're ready to render back out the disk. But if you do this, um, it's going to help you keep track of the logical flow of where things are fitting. One of the big mistakes that I see newbies make uh, in Nuke all the time is you can rearrange these things however you want, right? So I can have this merge here, I can have this merge over here, I can have this grade node down here. And it doesn't change the way the thing works, but it's almost impossibly confusing to figure out how everything's coming together. So it's really important, probably one of the most important skills you can learn in node-based compositing is how to lay things out neatly. There's a bunch of other things you can use which we won't get into today, like you can add uh, backdrop nodes, which kind of help to segment different functional parts of your comp into groups that are easier to figure out later. I'm just going to undo that because we're not going to do that right now. Um, but there, the organization is a huge part of this. And so this is just my recommendation. If you build this kind of diagonal spine starting at top right and flowing down hill to the left, uh, you know whatever is at the very bottom of your comp is the final node that you're rendering out to disk. And also, uh, you can easily see the sequence in which things are being added and what goes on top of what because everything's laid out neatly. So I'd encourage you to uh, get into some kind of workflow like that. Uh, just so you know, in, in Fusion, in Resolve, you actually work left to right. You can work top down, but it's really designed there to work left to right. Same principle. But in this case, you've got sort of pipes flowing from left, and then your final output is on the right. Uh, here in Nuke, we always work top down, where the top right thing is going to be uh, the farthest back layer, and then we layer on top as we go down. Okay? Um, so, we've the one extra thing we just added is we now have this grade node. And so... <coughs> Think of the grade node. This is like a filter or effect. Uh, in this case, it's a color corrector. Think of it as some ugly factory that's built itself on the riverbank, right? So the background stream, which is the farmyard, the ground, it, it's flowing down here. And then all the water has to pass through this factory, which kind of pollutes the water. In this case, the pollution effect is darkening. And the only part of the water, the only part of the image that passes through the factory's pipes is the part that we've limited by this mask. Anywhere where the mask has bright pixels will get affected by this grade. So this is like a polluting uh, factory on the riverbank. And so the result is the water that comes out the other end is polluted and affected by this node. In this case, it's a grade node. You'll see, I just brace bar back down to the four quadrant view. You'll see if I select the grade node and press B for blur, I now have a blur node, and we haven't looked at this so far, but over on the right-hand side here, when you double-click a node, it brings its properties to the top of this Properties tab. You'll see Blur has a size slider. If I drag it up, now my farmyard becomes blurred, right? Because now the farmyard ground clip, its stream is passing through a Blur node, and it pollutes the water again, and so the output of this stream coming out of the blur is polluted by the blur and affected by it. Notice that the only thing being blurred is the farmyard. The UFO isn't being blurred, the sky isn't being blurred, the Eiffel Tower isn't being blurred. Why is that? Because the farmyard, the ground, is the only thing upstream from the blur. So it's the only thing to be affected by the blur. <laughs> if I wanted everything to be blurred, I could uh, this is an awkward hotkey, but you just kind of need to learn it. Uh, if you select a node and press Control shift x it'll pop it loose. If I was to take this Blur node and put it down here, for example, instead, now everything except the UFO gets blurred. Why? Because everything except the UFO is upstream from that blur, so it all gets affected. 
The UFO does not get affected because it's on a separate stream and it never passes through the blur. Okay, it's very simple. So I'm going to go ahead and select that blur and hit delete. And there we have our comp. We've got the ground being affected by this grade node. And uh, we have a merge merging in the result of that grade combining everything coming down at the very bottom of the hill we have our final composite okay um, so that's all cool let's now that we have an idea about how this is all working let's just take a look at a couple of implications and then I'm going to show you through some of the other features here in terms of wiring stuff up and moving things around okay first of all you'll uh, notice that in fact let's throw the, I'm going to select that grid again and press B to add a blur again and I'll crank the blur up alright so we have blurred out, blurred out the farmyard what if we want a copy of the farmyard that doesn't have the blur on it and doesn't have the shadow applied to it well all we need to do is go back up to this ground node and press 1 and you'll see here the farm yard hasn't been blurred because this is upstream from the grade node. This is before it gets color corrected and before it gets blurred. So if we want a fresh virgin copy of our farm before it gets blurred, we can just pull it off. So for example, one of the things you might want to do is add a luma key to isolate just the highlights of the image. And the way we can do that is if I click away from all the nodes. You'll notice that I have my blur node selected. It was highlighted yellow. If you click in the empty gray space, it deselects all selected nodes. And when you want to add a node that isn't connected to anything, that's what you want to do. So I'm going to click in the gray space to deselect all the nodes. Hit the tab key. Now we haven't done this yet, but when you hit the tab key, it brings up a tool picker and you can choose the specific node you want. So far, I, I've had you press M for Merge, G for Grade, B for Blur. But in this case, um, this is a node that doesn't have a keyboard shortcut. Obviously, there's only so many keys, uh, 26 letter keys, and there are a lot more nodes than that. So in this case, we want to be able to uh, type in the name of a node to look for. On the left-hand side of the interface, I'm just going to click out of here for a moment, you can see we have lists of all the nodes that are available right big long magical list but uh, if you already know the name of the node you're looking for you can just hit the tab key so click in the empty space of the viewer hit the tab key and type it in in this case it's just called keyer k-e-y-e-r and you can use the up and the down arrows to move through the list of possible matches and in this case it's just keyer k-e-y-e-r I'm going to down arrow to that and hit the enter key or return key and that will add that node from the tab group into the node graph. I can then take the input arrow here and drag and connect it to the ground and if I select this key here and press 1 I can load it into the viewer. Now I can't see the effects yet because this is having an effect on the alpha channel. So if I click in the viewer and press the A key, I can actually see a black and white version of the clip because this is what's being luma keyed. And now if I drag these yellow vertical lines, mainly the A line and the uh, B line, I can actually choose what part of the image to luma key. All right. So if we wanted to kind of add a highlight, blur, glow, we could isolate it like this and to get back to looking at the color channels I just click in the viewer and because I pressed the A key last time if I press the A key again it will go back to the color channel so A will toggle between the alpha channel the channel that shows you the uh, visibility uh, transparency of things and the color channels uh, if you want to look at the red channel you press the R key the green channel the green key, the G key and the blue channel the B key as you probably imagined and to get back to the color channel do not press the C key because that will actually take you to the top 3D view um, if you get that just press the tab key to tab back to looking at uh, the regular channels so to go back to the color channel you just press the same key you pressed last time so if it was R 
you would press R again. Um, worst case, even if it wasn't R, you press R twice and it will take you back to the color channels, right? So RGBA to look at the red, green, blue, and alpha channels. And whichever button you press last, press it again to go back to the color channels. Okay? Um, so we've created a lumen key in the alpha channel here, right? Um, if we want to only see that part of the image, uh, we have to do what's called pre-multiplication. Now, in After Effects, that is an automatic thing that always happens. Uh, you don't always want things to be pre-multiplied. Sometimes you just want to carry that transparency information along for the ride and use it later. But typically, uh, if you do want to use it, what you're going to do is add in Nuke a node called pre-mult. So you select the Luma key here, the keyer node. It's highlighted yellow to indicate that it's selected. And I'm going to hit the tab key and type in PRE for pre -malt. And I'm going to hit the down arrow a couple of times to go down to pre -malt. And when I hit return or enter, now I've highlighted, uh, I've pre multiplied the alpha channel against the color channels. And so we're now only seeing the parts of the image uh, that the keyer uh, keyed out. Okay? So this pre mold node is important. Whenever you're working with unpre multiplied images, you need to pre-multiply them. Unfortunately, uh, this morning we don't have time to get into pre-multiplication. Uh, we can look at that in a later video. Uh, you guys are probably going to be stuck at home for a while, so uh, we're going to be doing more of these, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions on that topic. It's a little bit of a mysterious topic. Um, it doesn't need to be. It's just that there are a lot of people out there that don't understand it, and so they explain it very poorly. Uh, and so we will take the time to kind of cover that off in a later lesson. But now we've got the pre-multiplied version. What I could do is I could take this and I could add a blur node to it and I could blur just these highlights. All right, so I just selected the pre mult press B to add a blur. And then in the properties for the blur, I just dragged it up. And now we could screen that back over as little highlight glare over our original shot. Now, I don't know why you would do this except that it makes for a good tutorial, but uh, let's do it anyway. So I'm going to actually drag select through the luminance, the pre mult and the blur and pull these down a little bit more. And then I'm going to merge this over the top of the final comp, right? So this is the bottom of the hill so far. So the blur that I've just added, I'm going to press M to add a merge, and we're going to put this over the top. And now I'm going to select it, press 1 to load in the viewer. Um, now, oh, and I still have this blur up here that we didn't want. So right up at the, uh, this was just to demonstrate things. Straight after the grade node, we have that blur. Go ahead and select it and hit the delete key to delete it. Um, and you'll see now that there's already some kind of glow here. But this is a standard over that we've done. Uh, a better choice when you're adding a highlight glow like this is to screen it over or uh, use an overlay or a, a soft light um, blend mode. And the way you access blend, blend modes in Nuke, some of you may be familiar with them from Photoshop, After Effects, or any NLE. Uh, blend modes are just different math for combining images. So if we double click on the merge at the bottom of the hill here, you'll look in its properties, you'll see something called the operation. And right now it's set to over. We're just going to change that to uh, screen in this case. And you'll see it brightens it up a little bit, and it's a nice overlay screen. And so if I click in the view and press the H key, remember we can scroll just like we can in the node graph, middle mouse pan, and then press the H key to have fit. Um, we've got this kind of highlight diffuse glow over our bright parts of the image. Makes absolutely no sense and I would never do this because it doesn't really add anything to the shot um, but it does give us a chance to have a look at this concept of branching off a node to use in two places so let's take a look at this now I'm gonna space bar back up with my mouse over the node graph press the space bar to full screen this node graph again for a moment and let's look at what we did here so we took a copy of the ground and we just added a shadow to it by darkening the area where there's shadow. We merged that in, and that became part of the comp. 
But we took another copy of this before it got the shadow added to it, so it has no shadow. We pulled a luma key on it. We pre-multiplied it to cut away everything that was outside of the luma key. We blurred that, and then we screened it over the top of everything else that had been before, right? So we're using this ground clip twice for two different things. Um, in a package like After Effects, this would require what's called uh, nesting or precomposing, where we'd have to create uh, two, a, a composition, precompose it, and then reference that composition in two different places. And um, one of the big problems, you'll hear a lot of people tell you that After Effects uh, can do any kind of visual effects that you can do in Nuke, and it's just as good a tool for uh, visual effects as anything else. Um, and there are a lot of really high-end, uh, especially kind of television, Netflix-style show visual effects that are done in After Effects. Um, but it's simply not true that it's just as good. Uh, it can do the work, but because of the paradigm of working in a layer stack, you end up getting to this point where you have these dozens of these pre-comps where you have layers nested inside of layers nested inside of layers, and it's very hard in your head to keep track of where everything is. Whereas in Nuke, you'll see that in this one space, uh, we have everything that we need to look at. So I can see instantly, oh, this ground clip's being used here to pull a Luma key, and this ground clip is being used here, color corrected, and then just dropped in as a main element in the comp. And uh, what I like to do, and this is overkill for this shot because there are only you know less than a dozen nodes here, but I like to add these backdrop nodes frequently and leave little notes in them, like uh, glow for uh, farmyard. All right, and I'll put this over like this, and and I. Yeah, again, overkill because it's so obvious, but uh, if, the, if there were more nodes involved in doing some of these things, I would add these backdrop groups, and I'd call this one, and I should, you know, for those of you who are curious, what I'm doing is I'm just drag selecting it through the nodes in their entirety that I want in those groups, hitting the tab key, typing BAC for backdrop, down arrow to a backdrop node, hitting enter, and then to actually add the comment, I double click the header, with these backdrop nodes, you don't want to rename the node itself, the backdrop node, because that's not really very helpful. You want to add a label. And so I'm going to call this add shadow to farmyard. And then I need to resize by grabbing the lower right corner of this so that it maps out better, and then just repositioning these things. And the value of this is these comps quickly grow on a major feature film shot. I'll end up using, you know, a couple of hundred nodes at least before the shot's done. And so once you start grouping like this, instead of going and looking at two or three hundred nodes and going, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? I kind of remember what I was doing in this shot. Um, you can go, okay, my my only job is to come in here and tweak the shadow. It's too dark and the director or the, the uh, supervisor wants the shadow to be lightened up. And instead of being terrified at 300 nodes staring me in the face, I can go, oh, here are the nodes that are adding the shadow. I'll just hone in on them and uh, load up this node and change the shadow intensity. So because I've made these groups, I don't have to decipher all 300 nodes to figure out what two of them are doing. I can just focus on that one little compartment that's doing one simple thing and uh, get that done. And so for your, for your own sanity, I would strongly encourage you to get in the habit of labeling these groups as you go. Uh, like I said, this is kind of ridiculous because any, any competent compositor could look at this and go, oh, okay, luminance here, there's a blur screening in. Oh, they must be taking the highlights and screening them back over the image. This makes sense, right? Um, that's not the case in other situations where you have a lot more nodes. So typically, I'll have about a dozen or so nodes in each one of these groups. And I'm very careful to figure out what functionally they're doing. But it's so much easier to read this than if I was trying to do an effect in After Effects where I may have 
20 or 30 of these pre-comps and I can only have one of them or maybe two if I've got a big monitor visible at once and I have to keep clicking back and forth to figure out what's going where. And that's really uh, the main reason we work in nodes is one, because uh, we can clearly and easily see this nesting happening and two, because we can quickly decipher by moving up and down the node graph to see uh, where things are going wrong without having to uh, show and hide layer upon layer uh, to get that working. And th those are the key benefits to node-based compositing as, as far as working with the nodes. And then there's just a lot of other efficiencies like 32-bit float space in terms of color precision uh, and all kinds of things like that that uh, really add to it. Um, so we're, we're kind of coming close to the end of the session. I just want to show you couple of other things just in terms of how to get around in Nuke and then uh, we'll wrap it for today. Uh, hopefully we'll do some more on these to take you into some of the deeper stuff. And I also want to just quickly point you to a couple of resources on MovieLR.com uh, that allow you to go a little deeper. Uh, first of all, uh, we've already seen how we can look at the red, green, blue and alpha channels. Uh, to actually play back, you press the play button under the viewer, believe it or not. And then you can use the J, K, and L keys. The J, K, J key will play backwards, L key forwards, K to stop. Um, and you'll notice that there's this orange line. It What it does is it takes the frames and it calculates them and then renders them into cache, initially into RAM cache, and then it will stick them into uh, your hard drive cache. And you can point it at like a really fast drive, like an NVM, NVMe storage, and then you'll be able to stream off the much bigger hard drive cache if you need to. But uh, you'll see I can play back smoothly. The J and L keys will play back. You do need to click in the viewer before you press J and L. One of the problems that will sometimes happen is if you've been adjusting, say, your multiply values over here, and then if you go in the viewer and start pressing L to try and play back, it's actually going to write L's into that multiply box instead of uh, actually changing the viewer with the keyboard shortcut. So you need to click into the viewer before you start using JKNL or pressing F or H to frame uh, and the rest of it. Okay, um, so we've learned the fundamentals here. We've looked at the, the graph. We haven't really covered keyframing, tracking, or anything else. This is probably as much as we can really gonna get done before your heads explode today. Um, I'm just trying to make sure we've covered off the essentials. Uh, so just to round out the interface, we've got a curve editor here. We've got a dope sheet, which is very much like the After Effects style of dragging keyframes around. And um, we don't have any keyframes, so there's nothing to drag. And then we've seen that the properties are over here on the right-hand side. Uh, there's also a full 3D view. If you click over the viewer and hit the tab key, you can toggle to a 3D environment. And uh, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we have here. There is a camera tracker. And the great thing is this non-commercial version of Nuke uh, is uh, fully functional. It doesn't even add watermarks. The only limitation is that, uh, and there's a couple of other limitations in terms of Python scripting and things, but the main limitation is you can't render anything out greater than 1920 by 1080, but there's no watermark on the renders. Um, so in the chat, you've explained why nodes in, I, I'm assuming <laughs> Nuke, not Nike, uh, Nuke are better than Layers and After Effects, but why is Nuke better than Resolve? I can't really figure out the difference. That is a great question. Um, technically, Nuke and Fusion are um, the same in their functionality. Uh, the reason why Nuke is so much bigger in the film industry is, number one, uh, it's just been around a lot longer, and it's kind of a little more battle-proven. Uh, but, you know, since Blackmagic acquired Fusion and added it into Resolve, we're going to see uh, Resolve become a much more uh, commonplace tool. Obviously, if you're in a boutique studio, um, if you're paying 7000 bucks for a Nuke X license, or I don't, I don't know if that's the current price, and then $1,500 a year in maintenance, or you can buy a full version of Resolve for 300 bucks, and at least so far, Blackmagic's never charged for an upgrade. Uh, Fusion makes a lot of financial sense. Um, 
the new tool set is probably a, a, has a few more advanced tools in Fusion, uh, but for the most part, the things you can get done in Nuke, you will be able to get done in Fusion. Um, Nuke is just still the industry standard at visual effects studios. But if you're looking for something for you know uh, a boutique studio where you're working by yourself, uh, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at Fusion, and uh, we'll talk about the tutorials we have in a moment. Uh, Megan asks, seems like node placement and management is critical in this application. I'm glad you, you made that comment because that is absolutely true. Um, this whole housekeeping thing, now I'm not a tidy person by nature, I'm pretty ADHD. Uh, so I'm, you know, in the real world my desk tends to get pretty cluttered, but in Nuke I am fastidious about making sure that I don't go too far in my comp um that hopefully I hopefully we didn't drop out there I saw uh, a bit of uh queuing problems there so anyway uh, I'm fastidious when I'm building my comps to make sure that uh, I keep things organized and uh, I've had situations where I've had freelancers come and work for me and they will build their shot and then they'll disappear off to another job client will come back and say hey uh, we want to make changes to that shot we weren't happy with this this and this and I'll open it up and it will be that literal um, tangled mess of 300 nodes with everything all over the place no organization and I'll maybe spend an hour or two trying to fix what they spent maybe three days working on in the end I have to give up and just rebuild it from scratch um, so yeah, um, Megan's comment as well. This is a great comment. Uh, you can get a one-year license if you have an EDU uh, or are an educator. That is true, and not only that, but if you are in high school or university and you are doing something related to visual effects, some kind of uh, you know graphics course, you can not only get a get a, a license for free for every year, a full license, one that's not limited to 1080p output not only can you get a free license for the entire time you're in the course but when you graduate you can get a f the full nuke suite or nuke by itself for I think like 10 or 20 percent of what an actual license costs so that is a really great deal if you're if you're a student right now uh, and you're looking to get into this uh, you're potentially saving yourself a lot of money and while the um, maintenance contract is 1500 bucks a year on NukeX, which is the full version of Nuke, uh, my personal opinion is you can probably get by with not using the maintenance contract. Uh, you, really, the feature release, there's cool new stuff, but I have a version of Nuke. Um, one of my licenses dates back to, I think, 2012 or 13. And it's still more than enough for most of the production work we do. Some of the new features are cool, but the core tool set has been around for a long time. So if you were to buy Nuke today, I can't imagine there'll be too much added over the next three or four years that it's worth spending 1500 bucks a year updating it. Now, I could be wrong. They may add a bunch of machine learning content. Um, but certainly you get the first year of maintenance for free once you once you bite the bullet and buy it. Uh, but that license, that education thing is an incredible deal. If you get, I feel like it's 10% of the actual price or something like that, or maybe 15, but it's a great deal. Uh, any other questions on uh, Nuke before we kind of wrap this session? I, and I quickly take you to some other resources. No, we good. Uh, you can continue to, uh, you know, review this. We will just edit edit a little bit and put it back up on YouTube in the next uh, day or so for you guys to have as a resource to watch. Uh, we'll also get it on the Moviola site. But let me quickly take you to uh, some other resources. Okay, um, if I'm totally new to this and want to get into the industry is the question in the chat. What do you do? Uh, I guess that's the other part of the question. Answer is... Uh, Learn as much as you can. Um, this is a this is a tricky one. I mean, I'm a Jesus-loving hippie, so at the end of the day, I think uh, God has a big part to play with uh, 
getting into things. Oh, the question is nuclear fusion for the long term. Uh, I'll give you my other career advice in a second. But uh, for the long term, for the visual effects industry, I would still say you want to learn nuke. If you want a job in a visual effects studio, uh, that will definitely be the case. If you're more interested in working like in a smaller boutique setting, in a regional outfit, uh, Fusion is a great choice, especially if it's a studio. You know, we're talking about anywhere from 2 to 20 to 30 people in the studio. Um, if the studio uses Resolve heavily, uh, Fusion makes a lot of sense because it's automatically integrated with the editorial. Um, so the editors can send footage to uh, visual effects guys to work. But if you really, if you say, hey, I want to go work at ILM or Weta or, you know, some other big studio, uh, Nuke is the one you want to learn. The great news is it's easy to transition between the two. And that's a great segue into this next little thing. If I go to MovieOla.com here, and uh, you'll see, and I showed these at the very beginning, but in the Survival Guides section, under Fusion, we actually have a Nuke to Fusion guide. So you can take everything you've learned from Fusion and see how it applies, uh, sorry, everything you've learned today in Nuke and see how it applies to Fusion. Uh, it's a, they're very similar, so it's mainly kind of going, okay, what is the uh, grade node called in Fusion, and how does it work, and those kinds of things. So that's how you can translate. It's a These are very short. The whole point of MovieOla.com is everything's designed to be quick and easy, so all of these quick start guides are 30 minutes or less. Uh, we've also got a quick start on Fusion and Resolve so that you can get to know it. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Aragaldi, could you clarify that question in the chat? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. I'm guessing English is not your primary language, but if you can maybe uh, clarify what you're asking on Blender. Uh, Nuke does work with Blender because it will do EXR support. Um, you know, in terms of getting into the visual effects industry in general, what I would encourage you to do is find a place to work and if you can afford to, offer to be a PA or whatever and just get to know the people there uh, and then they'll start throwing you work and before you know it they'll actually need you to be getting paid to do that work. That's usually the best way in. Uh, you can throw resumes at a million doors. So much easier to come in the back door by saying, hey, I'll just get you guys coffee if I can kind of hang around and learn some stuff. And uh, that's the best way in if you can afford the pay cut while you're doing it. Or if you can just work two jobs. Uh, let's quickly look at uh, some other things on MovieOla.com because a lot of people aren't aware this is here. And we've spent a lot of time building this stuff. One of the ones, uh, it, it looks kind of funky because we've got this very simplistic design style. One of the areas I'm particularly proud of is the screenwriting. We've uh, boiled down two of the major books on uh, screenwriting, which is Robert McKee's Story and uh, Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. And we've kind of distilled these in these really tight little videos. You'll see this only 14 minutes, 7 and a half minutes, 12 minutes. Uh, they're very short, but they cover a lot of the fundamentals of storytelling. Another one that uh, I just want to call out some of these, uh, the in the uh, cinematography section, Shot types, framing is a fantastic 15-minute series, coverage. These are just teaching you. One of the things I've found is especially motion graphics artists and 3D artists tend, because they haven't come from a classical production background, tend to not understand framing and things like that real well in terms of how to compose a shot for the most visual appeal, how to get perspective working for you, how, how to add uh, leading uh, space in frames and things like that. So while you guys are bored and down and trying to find things to do, uh, I would encourage you to check these out. Obviously related to what we've talked about today, the visual effects uh, section of the courses is, is huge. Uh, we talk about preparing uh, a scene for visual effects and then we, uh, this is another recap of node-based compositing. So if it's a little hazy for you this morning after what we've covered off, uh, this video will take you through the details better. There's also a sky replacement video uh, which shows you how to actually do the sky replacement. We cheated today. I just had that clip that um, 
was already kind of pre-baked and this will kind of go over that we have a series on tracking series on rotoscaping rotoscoping and then we go into uh, adding CG elements to a scene so this is actually how you would take something like this uh, Saturn rocket and make it look like it's in someone's backyard uh, green screen fundamentals this is actually how to shoot green screen correctly because that is a profoundly misunderstood craft and then how to actually key the green screen correctly once you have it in there uh, and then we also have the beginning of our 3D fundamentals course which is going to take you through uh, the essentials of working in 3D so then you can pick up any tool you want blender or whatever but you understand the essentials of how 3D works uh, and then uh, we do actually have a quick guide on blender in here so blender uh, if you're ha unaware it's kind of really over the last year hit a critical point in its development where it's starting to get adopted by major studios still has a cripplingly bad undo system which uh, is probably the one thing holding it back from really being used in big productions uh, but it, this is a great time to be learning blender and so we have a under 30 minute guide to blender uh, and I would encourage you guys to dig in and uh, you know, you've got a little bit of time on your hands potentially. This is a great time to be learning some of these new skills. I got guys to After Effects, uh, pretty much everything. Resolve, uh, all the important apps for the most part we have uh, quick 30 minutes of Avo Guides for here. And then lastly we have a Techniques section which covers off specific techniques. Um, screen inserts, motion graphics, templates in Adobe, how you would clean play to road out, um, how you do a dry for wet technique and these are either using nuke or fusion for a lot of them uh, tattoo removal uh, we've also got just some weird and wonderful things like an automatic rotoscoping tool in Python so um, encourage you guys to check those out as well and we've also tried to aggregate some of the best content from YouTube in here and finally if you have no idea what I'm talking about go to the guide section under glossary and we have bucket loads of little tiny five ten second sometimes longer videos that explain all of the cryptic terms that are part of our industry so if you're confused about a term uh, you can dive in here so if you've forgotten what I meant by clean plate uh, I think oh, my, uh, there it is I was gonna say we have to add a term uh, clean plate is there so you can go in and watch those and uh, learn about the techniques all right, uh, we're going to try and do more of these during the uh, lock-in of uh, 2020. So if you guys have other topics you'd like us to cover, uh, you can drop it in the chat. I'm going to try and do another um, kind of a follow-up to this if I can and, and take you a little deeper into Nuke. Uh, but if anyone has any, any specific topics, I'll leave the chat open uh, for a few more minutes so that you can put it in there. Otherwise, hope you guys are staying safe and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.